Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome, and a very special welcome to our special guests, and I will do some introductions in just a moment. Um, please be seated. Okay. Um, I'm Susan Collins, the Joan and Sanford Wild Dean here at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy, and it's really wonderful to see so many of you here for our special program this afternoon. Um, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge our co-sponsor, the Lieberthal Rogel Center for Chinese Studies and its director, Mary Gallagher. We're delighted to have you here with us, and I know there are a number of affiliates of the center who are here as well. Welcome. Our special guest today is the Lieberthal Rogel Center's distinguished visitor, Professor Justin Yifu Lin. Um, we're so pleased to have you here at the university and also to welcome you to the Ford School. It's great to have you here. Well, Justin Lin is a man of many firsts. He was the first from a developing country or emerging market economy to hold the World Bank's top economist position. He was also one of the first in his generation from the People's Republic of China to earn a PhD in economics from an American university. As a young man, he left Taiwan, his birthplace, to cast his lot with China, which was then on the brink of economic reform and modernization. The University of Chicago taught Justin Lin to approach economics with a scientific method and a focus on hypothesis testing rather than ideology. And when he returned to China, he brought this approach first to his teaching for many years at Peking University and later as a key advisor to the State Council, China's cabinet. He served as founding director to the very influential China Center for Economic Research, a top government think tank based at Peking University. And Robert Zalek, in 2008, appointed him as the World Bank's chief economist. His tenure there advanced what he labeled the new structural economics, which was informed by very successful growth experiences in many Asian countries. And this approach really promotes economic growth through a portfolio of policy choices that combines a key role for markets in allocating scarce resources with a strategic targeting of government resources based on a country's comparative advantage. And that approach broke with what many saw as the World Bank's prior alliance on the so-called Washington Consensus that prioritized a neoclassical approach with very little role for strategic targeting. Well, China is now the second largest economy in the world after the United States and is navigating a growth slowdown. The question for today's conversation, what's next for US-China economic relations, is a really critical one, not just for the US and China, but globally. Dr. Lin is especially well-placed to provide both a substantive and very insightful perspective. Next, I would like to very briefly introduce my colleague, the director of the Ford School's International Policy Center, Associate Professor John Trichari. And I'll refer you to his bio in the program and simply say that it's because of his very deep expertise in a range of foreign policy issues that we have selected him as host for today's conversation. For today's event, we will follow the conversation format that's often used at the Council on Foreign Relations. And so John will kick things off with a series of questions. And after about 30 minutes of their conversation, he'll open up to questions from the audience. So beginning at around 440, members of our staff will be walking the aisles to collect question cards that you should have received when you came in. There's certainly an opportunity to get additional cards uh, if you would like them. Um, and Professor, Ford School Professor Ann Lin, together with Ford School students, Maisie Lee and Jennifer Chang will facilitate the question and answer session. For those of you who are watching online, um, please send us your questions via Twitter using the hashtag policy talks. And now please join me in a very warm welcome to Justin Lin and to John Chorchari. Thank you. Professor Lin, thank you so much for joining us at the Ford School. We're delighted to have you here today. And uh, as Dean Collins mentioned, I'd like to start off with some, some framing questions and conversation to get some of the key issues on the table. What I'd like to do is to start with a, a soliciting a few of your thoughts on the general state of the Chinese and U.S. economies, and then talk a bit about some of the key areas in which they interact, trade, currency, and uh, development policy or finance. Uh, and then, of course, we'll turn to what I'm sure will be a, a, a good set of questions from the audience. So let's start with the state of the Chinese economy. After this remarkable prolonged period of growth, China's economy is still growing well at about 6.5%. Uh, but like all economies, it faces uh, challenges. 
uh, which has led some analysts to predict a hard landing. I, I want to ask you first about some of those challenges and then turn to some bright spots and opportunities. One of the challenges is how to, is how to maintain growth in this environment of weaker global demand for exports, which have been such important contributors to Chinese growth over the years. Uh, the Chinese government, as you know, has set stronger domestic consumption as a goal for many years and recently announced some short-term measures that it will use to spur uh, consumption in the near term. I want to first ask you uh, whether you agree with that as, as uh, the appropriate near-term uh, goal for, for Chinese policy and then whether or not you think that the recent measures announced uh, are appropriate ways to try to spur consumption in the months ahead. Uh, the first one is that China's economy has been decelerating since 2010. And uh, you know that the average annual growth rate from 1979 to 2015 was 9.7%. And uh, last year, the annual growth rate was 6.9%. And it was lowest since 1990. And not only it was the lowest since 1990, it was the first time for China to experience six years of deceleration. Because as I mentioned, the average annual growth rate in the past 37 years was 9.7%. Certainly does not mean that China grew at 9.7% per year there was some fluctuation, sometime higher than 10%, sometime lower than 10%. But in the past, the growth rate will, would have rebounded after two or three years of deceleration. <coughs> this time, it was 16, six years already. But the downward pressure is still very large. And as you know, the Chinese government just announced the growth rate in the third quarters of this year, it was 6.7%. The first quarter, 6.7%, second quarter, 67 and the third quarters, the 67 was a substantial government support in August and in September. And so there's a lot of discuss about whether China it's going to have a hard landing or soft landing. Very much depends on the understanding of the reason for the deceleration in the past now almost seven years. For well, most people, they argued that the deceleration was mainly due to domestic structure, the growth pattern, and so on. It's internal rooted, including what you mentioned, that China should have switched from investment debt growth to consumption debt growth. But to me, yes, China is a transition economy. China is a developing country. China certainly has many, many structural problems development, pattern, and so on, those kind of problems there. But to me, China paid cost for those problems. However, the main reason for this deceleration is external <coughs> and cyclical. And uh, why I'm so confident to say the main reason for the deceleration is external and a cyclical because we can see other emerging market economies. They are at the same stage of development as China. They also have a similar pattern of deceleration. And their deceleration is even sharper than China. For example, 2010, the growth rate in China was 10.6%. 2015, 6.9%. But for Brazil, 2010, the growth rate was 7.5%. 2015, 
and 2015, negative 3.8 percent. For Russia, 2010, 4.5 percent. 2015, negative 3.7 percent. Similar deceleration and much sharper than China. India, 2010, its growth rate was 10.3 percent. China, 10.6 percent. 2015. 7.6 percent seem to be higher than China, but the pattern was similar, deceleration. And if you look into the reality in India, actually, 2015, the growth rate was higher than China for two main reasons. One was in 2012. Its growth rate dropped from 10.3 percent down to 5.1 percent. China from 10.6% down to 7.7%. So that deceleration was much sharper. And uh, as a result, there must be some rebounds. Secondly, we know that at the end of 2014, India adjusted its statistical method. And that adjustment allowed India to have one percentage higher in its growth rate. So if you took those two considerations into another you know, picture, India's growth rate in 2015 was lower than 7%, like China. And they did not have the similar problem. Some people say the deceleration in China was due to the state-owned sectors in China was still so heavy. They did not have the state-owned sectors. Some people refer to the deceleration was China invest too much. But all the other countries I mentioned, their investment was not large. But they have similar pattern. And the best way to prove my position is to look into other East Asian high income, high performing, export oriented economies. For Singapore, 2010, its growth rate was 15.2%. And uh, last year, 2%. Sharp deceleration. Korea, 2010, its growth rate was 6.5%. And uh, 2015, 2.6%. Again, sharp deceleration. They are high income, high performing economies. They are sup not supposed to have those structural problems as we you know, referred the in China. But they have exactly a similar pattern. So the only way to explain how come this group of economies, no matter their emerging economies, what they are high income, high performing economies. They all have a similar pattern. And not only so, they are continue to drop. For example, most likely Singapore this year is going to have negative growth rate. So the only way is external because high income country has not recovered and the trade has been slowing down sharply internationally and also in 20, 2008 every country adopted certain kind of counter cyclical interventions to support investment now after six, seven years those kind of projects completed but global economy has not completed unless you have another run of government support investment, investment growth will drop. So I think those are the main reasons. And uh, understanding that will put us in a better position to understand whether China is going to have a soft landing or hard landing. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's a convincing case that you make about the global environment. Clearly, there's a, uh, there, there are external mm -hmm. pressures on the Chinese economy. But the question remains how to respond to those. Yeah. Uh, and, and one of the possible responses, and they're not mutually exclusive, is to try to stimulate consumption. And another one, uh, which I'll get to next, is investment. But coming back to consumption for a moment, are the recent uh, plans announced by the, uh, the Chinese government, is that sufficient in your view to generate the necessary consumption over the coming months? Yeah, that, you know, it has been a popular view. If China want to sustain its growth, China should switch from investment that growth to consumption that growth. For that, I disagree. Consumption is very important. 
But if you want to make consumption as a driver of growth, what should be the precondition? Income needs to grow continuously. If household income does not grow and only household consumption increase, what would be the result? It's an open invitation of crisis. It's a recipe for crisis. And under the current situation, certainly increase in, in, in consumption is desirable, but we need to increase household income first. How to increase household income? We need to raise labor productivity first. What's the way to raise labor productivities? We need to have a technological innovation in the existing industries. We need to have industrial upgrading so we can relocate resources from low value added sector to high value added sectors. Both technological innovation and industrial upgrading require investment. Not only in the production sectors, we need to reduce the transaction cost during the process of economic development and mainly related to the infrastructure. So we also need to make investment in infrastructure. All those things require investment. Only by investment, you can ensure labor productivity continue to grow. And with the growth of labor productivities, certainly household income will increase, consumption will increase. Many people criticize that investment in China has been too high. But they forget, household consumption in China has been increasing rapidly. Each year, around 8%. And especially during those years with high investment, the household consumption increased even further, you know, from 8% to 9% to 10%. So I don't think that you know, investment is an issue. I think the issue is the fact that we can have good investment in area which I described. Technological innovation, industrial upgrading, further improvement in infrastructure. And for me, China still has plenty of opportunity for making those kind of investment. Fundamentally, China is a developing country. The sector that China currently occupies in general are low value added, middle range technology, middle range value added. China can still do industrial upgrading. China can still do infrastructure investment. And those kind of investment will generate job, income to the households, support their you know, consumption growth. So I think that the issue is not investment that grows. The issue is whether China has good investment opportunity and from my study, China still have plenty of room for good investment opportunities. Yeah, you've anticipated my next question, which is how to make that high level of especially government investment effective. Uh, and related to that, a number of by a number of metrics, China's investment uh, has been less efficient in recent years than it had been in the past. And that may be a natural uh, uh, process in the course yeah. of development. But I wonder if, in addition to, to sharing with us the ideas that you just did on what are some opportunities for productive investment, yeah. are there reforms that you think need to be made to make some of the existing investments more effective in the SOEs, okay. in the so-called old economy, and so forth? I think that here is that there are some empirical studies to show the return to investment in China has been slowing down. And uh, people think it's alarming. And uh, for me, those kind of study did not you know, put the cyclical business cycle into the consideration. Because now we are in the global business cycle. And uh, certainly because of the demand globally reduced. And uh, certainly you have some kind of excess capacity in the economy. And under the kind of situation with exit capacity, private sector's investments incentive has been repressed. And under this kind of situation, it should be a good opportunity for the government to make investment in infrastructure. And uh, to make investment in the infrastructure, you know, first, especially for a developing country like China, there's still bottleneck in infrastructure, in environment protection, 
those kind of investment can release the bottleneck of the growth. And so, and especially those kind of investment in the general private sectors would not have incentive to make. And so the government should be responsible for the infrastructure for the environment. And if the government should be responsible for that, what would be the best time to make those kind of investment? Under the downturn in the business cycle would be the best time. The reason to make investment in a downturn is because first, it's create job, reduce the need for unemployment benefit. And the opportunity cost of making those kind of investment will be lower. Secondly, the raw material, the construction material during the downturn will be cheaper. And so you make those kind of investment, the best time is to do the investment during, you know, sometime like now. But those kind of investment in general are long term. And uh, by definition, their return will be lower. If their return is not lower, private sector will do that already. And so if it's a government responsibility and the return will be lower, and uh, even statistics show the return to investment is lower. But it's best time to do it. And, 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 and so if we understand this dynamics to stimulate the private sector investment, the most important thing is to increase the confidence of the private sector for the future of the Chinese economy. For the, profit, for the private sector, whether they are going to make investment or not, very much depends on their prospect of the futures. And that's the reason why I started with my intervention to understand what is the cause for the slowing down in the Chinese economy. Because if you think the slowing down in the Chinese economy is mainly internal structure, then you get to be very pessimistic. Because to make adjustment in the economic structure, it's very difficult. Everyone understand US economy need to have structural reform. European economy has to structural reform. Now it has been eight years. Structural reform has not been in place. Japan, you know, everyone knows they need to have a structural reform. So Abe, you know, after he took office, he wanted to carry out structural reform. And so Abe has Abenomics had three arrows. And the last one is related to the structural reform, but it has not been implemented yet. And so if you think the slowing down is many structure, then you get to be very pessimistic. And if people about think that it's structural, they are pessimistic, they are not going to make investment. So it's very important to understand the true causes. Understand, yes, we have some structural problem, but the main reason for the deceleration is cyclical. And a cyclical, the government need to have a interventions. And for China, we still have many good opportunity for making interventions because we still have many structural, we still have infrastructure deficit in China, environmental deficit in China. And those are good investment opportunity. It has, those kind of investment will have high economic return and social return. And China is still in a very good position to make those kind of investment because government debt as a percentage of GDP is only 57%. And the Chinese debt, actually, the net debt is much lower than that. Because in other countries, the government debt was used to support consumption. In China, the government debt were used to make investment. So there's a real asset. Net debt is much lower than that. And so that gives the opportunity for China to expand its debt to support the investment. And as long as we support the investment, then the economic growth will be maintained, and if the government, you know, the economic growth rate maintained, the private sector has a lot of business opportunity there. They will have more confidence. So for that, I think that, you know, if we truly understand that, convey that message, then I think the private sector will have more, you know, idea, more willingness to make investment, and that will generate support the growth target that China you know, hope to achieve 6.5% and above. And uh, for that, I have not thought China will be able to achieve. Okay. One other thing that 
is a concern arising from, from high levels of investment mm -hmm. and debt is, is the possibility of a housing bubble, which has been frequently yeah. discussed, and also the possibility that as non-performing <coughs> loans pile up in the banks, yeah. that there could be uh, uh, some form of financial crisis. How yeah. concerned are you about those contingencies, and do you think the government's taking the right steps to address them? Those two sectors, we need to pay high attention to that. High leverage in the corporate sectors, in the government sector, certainly we need to pay high attention to that. But the key issue is that whether they were turning into some kind of systemic crisis, for that, I'm quite sure they were not. The main reason, the first one, is that high leverage of corporate sectors, the government debt is quite low, household debt is quite low, and the corporate debt in China is high. But corporate debt has some kind of cyclical situation. Because we know China is a bank-based financial system. Corporate sector borrow to make investment, and before they realize their revenue, they are going to have high leverage. And if you look into the Chinese economy, now the sectors which have alarming high corporate debt are the sectors in the construction material sectors. Steel, cement, aluminum, and glasses. They're all related to construction materials. And so that's the reason why I think it's very important for China to support the fiscal expansion to engage in infrastructure investment because they will create a demand for those kind of construction material. And as long as the demand in that kind of sectors mean maintained, profitability in that sector will, man, will be maintained. And they will be able to pay back their debt, then reduce the corporate you know, uh, 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 leverage. And uh, this was something I'm arguing in the past you know, years and uh, months. And uh, the evidence support me. For example, I mentioned the last, the third quarters. In July, the investment reduced a lot. So people talk a lot about excess capacity, high corporate leverage. And uh, the government you know, increased its investment in August and September. Immediately, the excess capacity situation turned into shortage. And, and uh, the prices of you know, cement, steel, and uh, coal increase. And uh, they, have, they become profitable. Once they become profitable, they pay back their debt, right? So, so that's some sectors that we need to pay attention to. But as long as we maintain reasonable high growth rate, then they will be able to repay that debt, and they will not turn into a crisis. That's one thing. And secondly, it will not be a crisis it's bec also because all the debts are in Chinese currencies. As long as it's in Chinese currencies, even some bank may have some problem, but the government can easily come to rescue, right? And so the government will have the ability to meet this kind of sporadic challenges in certain areas, even that kind of situation occur. And I think most likely they will not occur. And, and, and so for this area, we need to pay attention to, but it's not you know, so scary as some people describe. That is for the corporate debt. Then the housing bubble and so, for that is that. To me, housing sectors, real estate sectors, will continue to be the pillar industry in China for two reasons. The urbanization rate in China today is 56% of the population. To become a high-income country in general, the urbanization rate will exceed 80%. So China is still in the urbanization process. People will continue to move from rural areas to urban areas. As long as they move to the urban area, they need to have housing. And so we are going to have a continued housing construction. Second, the income in China still increased very rapidly because even China maintains 6.5% growth rate. Population growth rate in China is only half a percent. 
And so that means household income will increase about 6% per year. About every 11 years, the income will double, household income will double. And under the kind of situation with high income, they would like to have a larger house, they like to have a better house. For these two reasons, I think uh, in our construction in the real estate will continue. There will be a main source of investment in China continuously. But certainly, housing real estate, not only for the purpose of living, people use that as a way for speculation. And so the speculation can cause some trouble. China need to pay attention to that. And you can see the Chinese government adjusts the policy when the housing price increased too rapidly. But whether it will be a bubble or not, you know, it's very hard for me to predict. 20 years ago, I already say housing price in China is too high. And if I do not convince the housing price in China was too high 20 years ago, I would be billionaire now. <laughs> 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 well, you, you've shared a number of, of thoughts on, on challenges Chinese, China's economy is facing uh, and, and also some opportunities and ways the government can manage it. I'd like to turn very briefly uh, to the U.S. and ask you a similar question of what you see as sort of the principal near-term vulnerabilities in the U.S. market that are of concern to China. And then in the sort of medium term, what are a couple of the key structural barriers that you see to, to sustain U.S. economic yeah. growth? Well, U.S. economy is certainly still is the largest economy measured by market exchange rate. And the growth in, China, in the U.S. will be very important not only for the U.S. but also for the world. U.S. is the largest importer in the world. And if U.S. can maintain the growth, then the market for the exporter in the world will be larger. And, and so it's very important you know, for, the, for the U.S. and for the world. And the issue is that U.S. used to, used to grow at about 3.5%. Now, even after almost eight years, the growth rate in the U.S. is only about 2, 2.5%. And so whether the U.S. will rebound back to the 3.5% would be crucial. And uh, how come after eight years, the US economy has not fully recovered? When I was in the World Bank, many people at that time argued, if you look in the past experiences, any crisis originated from high income country, it will last only three quarters to seven quarters. And now it's almost eight years. So, you know, the reason why the U.S. economy has not fully recovered is because of you had not really carried out the necessary structural reform. And uh, how come the structural reform is so hard? Because structural reform, if you carry that out in the long run, good for the economy, increase your competitiveness, increase your resilience, that certainly should be good. But in the short run, in general, structural reforms are contractionary. And it will put down the economic growth rate, it will raise the unemployment rate, and politically it's very hard to carry out. But is there a way to carry out a structural reform? If you look into the financial crisis in other countries in the world in the past, because in the past, mostly, the crisis occur in developing country, and then when they have the crisis, they come to the IMF for rescue, and the IMF will recommend three policies. The first one, structural reform. With the understanding structural reform is contractionary, and you already have very high employment rate, how to carry out that? The second one is sharp devaluation of the currency to increase the export and the expo increase will create a job, offset the contraction of the structural reform, and uh, so they can carry out a structural reform, to create a room for structural reform. And the third policy certainly is to give some kind of fund to weather through the period. But this time, 
it's hard to use the valuation as a way to create a space for structural reform because the crisis hit all the high-income countries. And high-income countries, they are in a similar stage of development. Their production structure are similar. Their export markets are competing with each other. And under this kind of situation, if US you want to use devaluation to create a space for structural reform, you are going to have competitive valuation in Eurozone, in Japan, or the Eurozone want to have a, you know, devaluation as a way to compete, to, to create a space for structural reform, US will have a competitive devaluation. So we are in a deadlock. And under this kind of situation, we need to have a vision, we need to have a new innovative way to make the structural reform in a high-income country feasible. And, uh, and uh, that requires political leadership, requires vision. And uh, if we do not have those kind of vision and political leadership, I'm afraid. The scenario <coughs> in Japan could be a scenario in the US. It's not good for the US. It's not good for the rest of the world. I want to tease out a little bit of your argument when you were characterizing the causes for, for China's slower growth. You emphasized the external pressures on the economy, yeah. but with the U.S. emphasizing sort of shortcomings in domestic structural reform. Yeah. To, what, to what extent do you think that, that external uh, factors are also responsible for the slowdown in U.S. growth? Well, certainly we are in a visual cycle, right? When, because the crisis started in the U.S., in the high-income countries, the slowdown started to happen in high income country. And so the expo that was hit. And a high income country has now fully recovered. So the growth of expo in the rest of war were suffering. We know that before 2008, the global, the trade growth was more than twice as high as the GDP growth in the world. But after 2008, now, first, the real GDP growth rate has been reduced. But the trade growth now is lower than the GDP growth. For example, beginning of this year, WTO predict this year trade growth will be about 2.8%. But now, they downward revise that to 1.7% sharply reduction in the trade. And uh, certainly, you know, the, 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 the income in the high-income country has not recovered, contribute to the reduction in the export from the developing world. And uh, because of the reduction of the export in the developing world, their growth rate dropped, and that reduced their demand for import from the high-income country. So we are in some kind of visual circle. But if you try to trace what would be the roots, because that we know developing country recovered quite well after 2008 and 2009. After 2009, most developing country has recovered to their pre-crisis growth. But because high-income country has not recovered, and uh, the trade growth has been substantially reduced, and that was the main reason for the developing country to be unable to maintain their growth dynamic uh, 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 momentum. So, you know, I, I, it's not I want to point the fingers, but the statistic, the analysis, you know, advise me, unless the high-income country fully recover. Otherwise, not only the high-income country will suffer, the developing country will also suffer. Okay. Fundamentally, high-income countries still contribute more than 50% of global GDP. They contribute to about, you know, more than two-thirds of global demand. In, 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 in a trade. And your comment about, about mm -hmm. a slower rate of, of growth of trade brings me to the next topic I want to ask you about, which is uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, uh, as, as our audience members uh, probably know, uh, this is a 12-country a uh, trade deal that includes a number of Asia-Pacific states, including the U.S. and Japan, but not China. There's still a chance that it'll pass in the lame duck Congress. If the TPP comes to fruition, what do you expect the economic effects of that to be on China and on the region? The first thing that I think is that to exclude China from TPP is not desirable. 
because China now is the last trading country in the world. And the country now involved in TPP, their trade with China is intense. China is either the largest trading partner or the second largest trading partner of those member country in the TPP negotiation. And we know the idea of TPP is to you know, improve the quality of trade and investment. Those certainly are desirable. But if you exclude China from that, and China is the largest trading country in the world and large, the most important trading partner with all the members, you excluding the elephant in the room. And uh, so under the kind of situation, I don't think that this uh, economically is, you know, it's advisable. It's, you know, good. Not only it's not good for China, it's not good for all the partners. That's one thing. But secondly, supposedly, this TPP agreement get approved in the Congress in every country. Is that going to hurt China so much? I think mostly psychologically than reality. Because if you look into, like Vietnam, like a few countries which are really compete with China in the trade, they already get some kind of preferential treatment in the trade relations with the US. So the reduction in the trade barrier to them is insignificant. And so the TPP you know, may marginally benefit them in the competitiveness with China. But I don't think it's going to be substantial. It's mostly psychological, not so economic in reality. Okay, great. Uh, the, the TPP discussion, of course, is linked to, uh, to currency issues between the U.S. and China. Um, lately, uh, although the value of the renminbi has slumped against the dollar, it's increased against some other currencies mm -hmm. like the euro and the Korean won. So there are some incentives for uh, uh, the Chinese authorities to reduce the value of the, of the currency in the near term. But of course, we're in a U.S. election season uh, where there's a lot of talk about the need to get tougher on China's currency. Trump says he would name China a currency manipulator. Hillary Clinton is also talking tough without making that specific threat. Um, what do you think that the Chinese authorities uh, uh, should and will do uh, in this context? I think that every politician always has some political needs and uh, to find a specific goal for you know, the problem domestically. And I can understand they use China as a spec goal, and especially now with the devaluation of Chinese currency, then easily to say a lot of things about China. But that look into the reality. But the look into the realities. It has been recommended that China need to adopt flexible exchange rate. And uh, it has been recognized a developing country should adopt management protein manage the protein and uh, to pack into a basket of currency, not used to the US dollar alone, to a basket of currency. The reason for the devaluation in the last months of Chinese currency is it's because of a sharp devaluation of British pound, of the Euro, or Japanese yen. And uh, China pack Chinese currency to a basket of currency, certainly US dollar is the most important component of this basket. But British pound, Euro and Japanese yen are all in a basket. And they all sharp, sharply devalue against the US. And under the kind of situation, certainly Chinese currency <coughs> need to devalue to reflect the valuation of this basket. I think that's a reality. And uh, to use the devaluation to say China manipulate the currency, actually if China do not devalue, that means China manipulate the currency. 
A devaluation is a natural consequence of this kind of global you know, currency, policy, currency situation. Part of this, of course, is, yeah. is and there are a whole host of arguments made about, about you know, China's bilateral trade surplus with the U.S. in yeah. goods and so forth, that that would be evidence of, of currency manipulation. Uh, but, but even those in the U.S. who are friendliest to the uh, Chinese government's point of view on this would say that the easiest way to sort of resolve this once and for all is to have a fully convertible currency and, and, and market determined rate and so forth. This is an express goal of the People's Bank. Um, what in your view are the key remaining steps to be taken uh, uh, to both make the, the uh, renminbi fully convertible and also to internationalize the currency? I think that um, you know, the model look into is that sometimes people you know, forget currency valuation is not only determined by trade, but also determined by capital inflow and outflow. And, 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 and so you cannot only look into trade to, you know, to, to, to decide what would be the market level of the exchange rate. And because of the large short-term capital inflow and outflow, that's going to have a large impact on the short-term valuation of the currencies. But short-term inflow, large inflow and outflow, it's not good for the economies. So in the past, like IMF, arguing the fully comfortabilities and the fully capital account liberalization. And uh, 2014, they changed the position. They think for a developing country, as long as their currencies are not reserve currency, it's desirable to have a capital account in the past called capital account control. Now they do not use the term control. They use the term management, especially if an high-income country has a very loose monetary policy. You know, zero interest rate or negative interest rate. Under that kind of situation, because the cost of capitals in high-income country is so low, investment opportunity in high-income country is limited, and you're going to see a large outflow of capital and short-term capitals flooding the other country. And uh, any kind of indication of interest rate hike will cause a large inflow, you know, return back of those kind of capital. That's going to cause a lot of trouble in the developing world. So under the kind of situation, it would be desirable to have some kind of uh, management of capital account. And under the kind of situation, as long as you manage the capital account, certainly it will affect the inflow and outflow of the capital, and it will affect some kind of exchange rate. So we need to come to the new realities. Fully capital account liberalization is not you know, consistent with the goal of, maintain, of maintaining stability and a dynamic growth in the world. And so to have certain you know, management would be desirable. And it's worth noting that the International Monetary Fund staff produced the paper a few years ago, yeah. conceding that there would be certain cases in which, uh, in which it, would, it would countenance that kind of, yeah. of management in a way that it hadn't in the past. Let me ask you one more question yeah. just to get an issue on the table, and then I'm going to turn to Jennifer and Maisie for some questions from the audience. And that is moving from sort of the IMF uh, uh, topic to more broadly yeah. international financial institutions. The advent of these new uh, bodies that have been led by China, uh, the BRICS New Development Bank, the Asian Infrastructure yeah. Investment Bank, the Contingent Reserve Arrangement. These have been seen by some audiences in the United States as a, as a direct challenge to U.S. leadership of the international uh, mm -hmm. uh, economic governance system. Yeah. In what respects are these new bodies actually intended as a challenge to the existing institutions, and in what ways do you see them as most complementary? I think it's mostly complementary. The U.S. leadership in the world, I think the motivation is to promote economic development, economic stability, economic growth, improvement of well-being of the rest of the world. That's the meaning of leadership. And then that looking into what is the bottleneck, what is the main barrier for the developing world to grow. Infrastructure deficit. 
And so it would be desirable for the growth in the developing world to have more investment in infrastructure. Certainly, we have multilateral development institutions like the World Bank, like the Regional Development Bank, and they are responsible for the infrastructure, infrastructure you know, investment in the developing world. But the amount of the resources they can command compared to the needs is too small. You know, according to the Asian Development Bank, in Asia alone, each year require 800 billion US dollars of infrastructure investment. And uh, in Africa, about 500 billion. In the world, about 2 trillion. And uh, compared to the resources the World Bank has and the Regional Development Bank, they just have a tiny portion of that. And but we have a lot of new resources that we can tap into. China, other emerging markets, they you know, have enough position to contribute more. But if you ask China, Brazil, India to contribute more to the World Bank, to the regional development bank, certainly you need to allow them to have a larger voice. No, no tax. No vote, right? <laughs> no vote, no tax. And so, you know, you have to adjust the governance structure in current existing multilateral institutions. But the high income country, including the US, are very reluctant to adjust the governance structure. And so, with the principle of no vote, no tax, then it's very hard to convince. China and other developing countries to contribute more. But we have a huge need in the developing world. So under that kind of situation, if we have a new institution which allows to China more resources, that would be desirable. That's one thing from the resources point of view. The second one, there's some competition is always desirable. Because now the multilateral institutions in effect, they are very inefficient. For example, they all have the residence ball. We have many people from the corporate. If your ball is resident, Oppo watch you on a daily basis. It's hard to manage, operate in that kind of situation. So you should allow some new governance, new ways and, uh, to compete. And other kind of situation, the efficiency of every institution can be improved. So from those kind of angles or point of view, if we really worry, if we really concern about the global growth, the global well-being, then the new institution like AIIB and the new development bank should be welcomed. Thank you. Jennifer and Maisie. We'll now take a few uh, of questions from the audience. Hello, hi. <coughs> Excuse me. Hi, I'm Maisie. I'm an MPP MA dual second year. Um, our first question is from the audience. <clears throat> and it says, the, G the GDP of China may exceed US in the future year. Um, and the US government has set, um, set up some boundary barriers to stop and or lengthen this, that period. So like, do you think it is possible to reduce the conflicts between these two countries and how to build up the trust and confidence between US and China? Yeah, I think that first we need to recognize the U.S.-China relations is win-win to China and the U.S. Because if you look into the relation, the most important relation should be economic relations because what we people care about actually is our living, our improvement. And that's all most related to trade, related to, to the economic relations. And uh, if you look into China and the US, currently the per capita GDP in China is about 8,000 US dollars. US 57 US dollars. And with such a difference in the per capita GDP, that means the labor productivity in the China and the US are different. The sectors that US you know, produce are much higher value added. And the sector that China produces a lot of value added. 
So actually, it's complementary to each other. We are not competing with each other. And to maintain good economic relations, certainly is good for China and good for the US. You know, China Expo, raw value added type of products which related to the different necessities, most like those kind of things, and reduce cost of living for the people in the US. Certainly that's good for the US people. And the US produce high value added you know, goods, mostly with you know, embodies higher technology that can help China to improve the productivities and also the Expo, those kind of high value, high tech type, capital intensive type good for China. That's also good for China. So we need to understand there's no fundamental conflicts in the relation between China and the US. And it's a win-win relations. But certainly, as I mentioned, politicians sometimes always like to find a scapegoat for the domestic issue. And the best way to overcome is to increase understanding. China should be, you know, better present itself, help people to understand China, and uh, Chinese people also need to understand the U.S. And with a better understanding, then we have a lot of common ground. So basically, I'm an optimistic people. I think that fundamentally, people care about their defense, their life, their well-being. And uh, the relation between China and U.S. will help us to improve our well-being, both in China and the U.S. Hi, my name is oh. Hi, my name is Jennifer Chang. Hi, my name is Jennifer Chang, and I'm a senior in the undergrad program at Ford. Um, our next question is also from the audience. What has been the economic effect of the structural division of China's workforce into distinct urban and rural labor markets? Is the urban rural gap an externality or an engine of China's growth? Uh, I did not fully get the questions. Yeah. The uh, urban, day, urban rural. What has been the economic effect of the structural division of China's workforce into distinct urban and rural labor markets? Is, it an ex is the urban rural gap an externality or an engine of China's growth? Uh, in China's labor market, it basically liberalized. You know, the urban, the rural levels, they can migrate to urban areas without much restriction. Although we have some kind of household residence, hookah system, and so on, and uh, it has some cost for rural people to stay in the cities but it's not a barrier for them to migrate to work in the urban areas. And that's the reason why I'm sure you heard the report. China has about 300 million floating population migrate from rural areas to work in the urban areas. So, you know, in terms of the, 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 in terms of the labor market, it's not such a big issue. But the income in the rural area and urban areas, the gap is quite large. And uh, I think it's both because in rural areas, they work in agricultural sectors, labor productivity in, in the agricultural sectors is lower than the labor productivity in the urban areas. And uh, because of that, it attracts a lot of all migration from rural area to urban areas. And under the kind of situation, I think the government should be responsible to provide more support to the social protection and, and also social benefit to the people left behind in rural areas in order to reduce the urban rural divide. So the issue is not in the labor market. The issue is in the disparity of income and the disparity in the public services in urban areas and rural areas. And for those kind of disparity, both the central government and the, the local government should you know, be responsible to narrowing the gaps. Okay. Um, okay, the next question um, is about your opinion of the degree to which military development in the South China Sea um, and 
is that a, an economic negotiating tool? Like, what are your thoughts on that? The South China Sea issues, yeah, certainly it's a hot topic. I think that uh, Deng Xiaoping has the best approach to the issue. Put aside the sovereignty and uh, jointly explore the opportunity economically. Because the sovereignty issue is hard to argue because China can have a lot of his government, his historical claim, historical evidence to show China has some kind of ownership in the South China Seas, islands, and so on. And uh, certainly, you know, the surrounding country, they will say they are so close to us, so we should have some sovereignty issue there, you know, claim there. So I think the best way, you know, because most importantly, it's economic. And uh, the best way is to jointly explore the opportunity together. While government investment is efficient in promoting productivity, it creates great uncertainty in transa transaction costs for private sectors as private firms may find it hard to anticipate government decisions. What do you think about this cost of government-led uh, investment? The government debt investment, the government in general would not invest in industrial sectors anymore. The government investment is mainly in the infrastructure. And the reason why the government make investment in infrastructure is because private sectors, their incentive to make investment in the infrastructure is so low. You know, it was some kind of change in ideologies. Before the 1980s, it was a conviction that the government should be responsible for infrastructure. And uh, multilateral development institutions like the World Bank, like the Regional Development Bank, they were also supporting the government to make investment in infrastructure. To give one example, the World Bank. Before the 1980s, the largest department in the World Bank was infrastructure department. But after the 1980s, with the rising of neoliberalism, people started to argue if infrastructure is economic development, it, it, it's, it, it's an investment based on economic principle, the market should take care of that. And so it changed from the government to be responsible for the infrastructure investment to that it's an economic activity, so the private sector should be responsible. We did kind of change our ideology. Certainly, the infrastructure development uh, department in the World Bank gradually dying out. So when I went to the World Bank in 2008, there was no department responsible for infrastructure. But what is the consequence of that? The consequence is that if you go to the developing world, for 30 years, there's only one type of infrastructure private sectors akin to make investment. Mobile phone, telecommunication. Other than that, the private sectors are not interested. And the reason why they are interested in the mobile you know, uh, telecommunication, because first, it's very easy to collect the money. Secondly, they have some kind of natural monopoly. So for the monopoly rent and the easy collect of the prices, the private sector is key. Other than that, the private sector are not interested. And that is the reason why if you go to a developing country, no matter the Latin America, South Asia, or Africa, you can see the infrastructure shortage everywhere. China is in a lucky, in a better position because China still to make the government investment in infrastructure. And so if you see the investment by the government, mostly in the infrastructure, not in the industrial sector, it should be desirable. And especially with the downturn in the business cycle, it's the best time for the government to make investment in infrastructure. So 2014, the IMF published uh, you know, in the October issue of 2014, of World Economic Outlook. I am a advocate. It's the best time 
for the government to make investment in infrastructure because of the, you know, the business slowdown in the world. So I don't think that, you know, so the observation now, the government investment as a percentage of investment in China increase is a big issue. It only reflects the slowing down in the economy and it's the best time for the government to make investment in infrastructure. As long as the government investment is mainly in infrastructure, it's not an issue to worry about. Earlier you talked about China's debt and said that most of the debt is are in the RMB. Thus, even if major crisis happens, the government can easily intervene. So in terms of the tools for intervention, is increasing money supply an option? And will that affect the chain exchange rate considerably? Um, the increase in the money supply will that affect the exchange rate compatibility? Is that your question, right? Yeah. Well, you know, the exchange rate com compatibility may not so much related to the money, monetary you know, supply. We see the high income country in the past seven and six years, seven or eight years, they all adopted quantitative easing, low and a zero interest rate, and now negative interest rate. But those kind of very loose monetary policy does not affect the country continue to adopt the you know, uh, 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 fully compatibility. It does not affect them to make their currency fully compatible. I think the consideration should be more whether China you know, should adopt fully compatibility. I think many related to whether trans yuan will become a reserve currency or not. And secondly, also very much depends on whether the financial sector in China is well developed. I think that if financial sector in China is well developed, and uh, with the gradual internationalization of Chinese currency, Chinese yuan become one of the major reserve currency, then that will be a good time for China to make the currency fully convertible. May I ask a quick follow-up on that? If you could share with the audience a couple of specifics of the kinds of things that you, uh, that you mean by having the financial market be, be well-developed. Yeah. Well, the financial market well developed means the equity markets is further you know, dependent, further enlarged. The debt market, the corporate debt, the government debt markets is large enough and well-functioning. And this kind of development also depends on the stage of development. Because the financial structure actually should reflect the economic structure. Because the main purpose of finance is to support, to serve the real sectors. And the real sector in China is that China currently with a per capita income or per capita GDP of 8,000 US dollars, most of the production activity in China today are still in agricultural sectors and in small and medium-sized enterprises in manufacturing and services. And, uh, and in general, they are still in mostly traditional sectors. And for them, the best way to serve them is banking and a bank arrangement instead of equity market or debt market. And because of that, the financial sectors in China cannot be as well developed as high income country like US, like European country. Because in high income countries, the main production are in the sectors of capital intensive, technology intensive sectors. And for them, they need to, you know, they are riskier and the best way to serve them would be the equity markets. And also, you know, those kind of large companies, corporate sectors, they are large companies, 
they are better structured and they can use that to serve them also. And also the government with high income, the government debt market will be larger. So those kind of the depths of the financial structure very much reflect the stage of development. And China has not reached that stage yet. And in 2000, after finishing my job, in 2012, I published a book called Against the Consensus. And for that, I have uh, several chapters to discuss. The global you know, financial arrangement, global monetary arrangement, and that discuss a lot of the issue you know, related to what you ask, whether China can have a fully developed uh, 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 financial sectors, whether Chinese currency can really become uh, global reserve currencies, and I think that China is not ready yet. Um, this will be our last question. China is experiencing a rapid growth in its graying population. How will population aging affect its economy, and how will the government respond to that? The aging is an issue has attract quite substantial attention, and uh, whether aging will become a uh, factor that causing the Chinese growth to you know, slow down significantly. I think that may not, for several reasons. One, aging reduced the working population, right? That's a main concern. But China, currently has an extremely early retirement age. For female workers, they retire at the age of 50. For male workers, they retire at the age of 55. With aging, reduced working population, we can extend the retirement age to offset that. That's one way. And more importantly, it's not the quantity of labor force count. It's a quality of labor force count. And uh, the quality of labor force very much depends on the education, the human capital accumulation. So aging is a slow factor. It can be predicted. And to offset that, we can invest more in education and uh, to increase the quality of the working population. And as you know, China invests very aggressively in education. I can still remember in 2000, the tertiary graduate each year is less than one million. Now, last year, the tertiary graduate students last year was 7.5 million, seven time increase. And I think that, that kind of accumulation of human capital can offset the impact from aging. So with that, you know, I think that it's one factor many people discuss a lot, but I don't think it will have such an adverse effect as many people you know, predict. Thank you so much um, to Justin Lin and John Tricard. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.